All right. Thanks, everyone, for joining today. The Trusted Sec webinar, Coverage Not Guaranteed, Navigating Cyber Insurance. Uh, my name is Stephen Marshowitz, uh, Director of Program Development here. And before we get started, just wanted to go through. There we go. A few uh, housekeeping items. Uh, we're definitely recording this, so you'll be able to check it out afterwards. Full replay will be on YouTube. And absolutely ask questions along the way, either in the Q&A or the chat. We'll, uh, we'll look to get to those uh, as we move along and, and even some at the end. So trusted set. Oh, good. We got a little poll coming up. Uh, that we wanted to just find out a little bit more about what you what your involvement is in cybersecurity, and so while we're waiting for that, I'll blow through these things. Um, we have services from you know all over the place, full service uh, to be able to help you from testing and analysis, program assessments for sure. Compliance has been huge. Uh, program management, we're getting a lot uh, involved in a lot of those. Uh, helping build the programs, remediation, uh, where we're brought in a lot for configuration reviews, but also those tactical areas that that I always say, if you know if you know what you're doing, it takes you three days. If you don't know what you're doing, it takes you three months. So we're always there to, to help with that training. And then, of course, if you do ever get into any kind of challenges, we have incident response. And that team also does the threat hunting, which I mentioned um, before. One of the services actually I did want to call out is our ransomware resilience, since it's uh, so relevant to this uh, webinar, as well as next, as well as January's. So ransomware resilience um, will review everything from your, as it would say, how resilient are you to ransomware? So we'll do it from a high level, your business needs, data classification, system criticality, um, crisis communications, we'll look at your cyber insurance policy as well, and then any legal responsibilities and capabilities. And then we'll also get into the, the tactical areas of what's your network and security policies, um, the architecture, how is your uh, identity and access management, backup architecture, of course, privileged accounts, uh, how you handle incident response and even threat management. And then we can do even more so where we get involved in a defensive backup review. So a deep dive from the remediation team I was talking about on your backup architecture, and then also validate it uh, using adversary simulation uh, techniques uh, that, uh, that the ransomware groups use. All right. And there's the results of our poll. So it looks like, yeah, a good majority uh, almost two thirds are actively involved with the CFO, COO, or risk officer. So that's fantastic. So, so that's great. Uh, you know, obviously we we have a lot of security folks on, so it's really, really good to see uh, that uh, being done. And, and only a few don't have any uh, involvement at all. So, so that's fantastic. So, thank you guys for joining. I uh, Appreciate that as well. Again, my name is Stephen Marshwitz. I'm the Director of Practice Development here at uh, Trusted Sec. So um, 23 years in experience uh, and doing uh, quite a few things. Um, uh, hand, I have an MBA from Case, which we'll get to in a second, which our next guest, uh, we're very excited to have, Mark Heron. Mark, you want to tell us a little bit about yourself? Sure. Hello. Thanks for having me. Uh, it's nice to uh, be in front of you all. So my name is Mark Heron. I'm the Chief Information Security Officer at Case Western Reserve University. Yeah. And we've known each other for 16 years, something yeah, like that. That's a long time. As he's getting in, as he was actually, probably both of us were kind of getting involved in security, at least uh, more so from the assessment space and getting getting more into it. So a lot going on. Uh, and then I want to introduce Jamie Alberts. Jamie is a ser senior security consultant here. Jamie, tell us a little about yourself. Uh, yes, uh, senior security consultant. I'm on the advisory side. Um, I have uh, many years experience uh, just within the infrastructure side uh, at some large uh, enterprise companies and uh, glad to be here. Awesome. Well, thanks so much. Look forward to everyone uh, uh, joining and, and getting to on with this. So to start off, <clears throat> I want to thank uh, Mike Owens from our team for this, uh, this image um, and again, setting up his is more depth in depth uh, webinar in January. But the reason why this webinar even came to be in the first place was because there's been uh, absolute enormous shift in 
uh, cyber liability insurance. And we all know it's due to ransomware. Ransomware has just absolutely changed the game for not only all of us, but also insurance companies as well. Uh, there is a cyber insurance provider coalition said that the average ransom demand made to their policyholders nearly tripled in the first half of 2020 to 2021 from 440,000 to $1.2 million uh, in losses. So that is a big deal for them, of course. Um, and so what they're really looking at is, well, we got to take a step back. We have a lot of changes within our own industry. And of course, and we'll talk in a second, the, the, it never, the, the underwriting was always a little bit more difficult because there weren't as many um, actuarials. There's not a, you can't go back a hundred years and see, you know, how many disasters there have been. So we're really driving into it. And that is really what's caused uh, our webinar today. So as we get into it, I know, um, you know, you folks probably, you know, are going through it, Mark, um, you know, talk about maybe some of your experience and kind of what you're seeing, you know, as you're building up ransomware defenses and just, you know, in essence, kind of what's uh, what started it and, and what's even started, in, you know, with you directly. Well, I mean, the big thing that with ransomware, I mean, remember, this has always been around for quite a while. It used to come in like a meteor strike, right? It would hit one machine and it would maybe lock up your hard drive yeah. and maybe a, a share or two that you're on. And so the, the real response was always around, OK, let's just recover the machine. And it has changed so significantly now. It's become an absolute enterprise threat. Right. So in the past, it was either maybe you would have a system, a whole system you'd have to restore. Now we're looking at if it gets in there, you know, the, as the, the slide shows, it's going to affect your Active Directory, your servers, your file systems, the critical apps, the workstations, all. Right. It's no longer just one thing. It's an omnibus threat. And that's new and different. And I think that's really escalated it both in importance from a technical perspective, but then from the financial side, it has really raised the bar on what a typical outage or ransomware attack might cost. Because in the past, it was almost always just a soft cost. And even, and I think we were talking about this before the webinar started, my, my plan for, for getting Bitcoin used to be, in all honesty, was uh, you know, 2012, 2013, I looked up where there was an ATM, right? And so there was an ATM in Detroit. So I figured, all right, great. If I need like six Bitcoin, it's 35 bucks. I'll just hop in the car, drive to Detroit, you know, put my card in, charge 35 bucks and come back with, with, with the Bitcoin essentially. Um, and that, that, you know, that, that was the plan in all honesty, it was no big deal. It'd take a couple hours. I'd just drive there and get some. And it's completely different now. Yeah. I, one of the trends you see or how it evolved, like you mentioned, it used to be single machine based you'd have an executive or somebody that's compromised. And yeah, that was a pain. It's four or 500 bucks that they're asking. Now you're looking at, could be company ending data loss if you do not pay ransom. Um, because not only are they taking out active servers, but they're starting to now target your backups. So if they go out and they completely delete all your backups, what do you do then? You know, so you're, you are now at their mercy that, you either need to pay the ransom to unlock it, or hopefully you've had some mitigation that uh, that you still have data somewhere that you can restore from. So you you really now are at the mercy uh, of the ransomware attackers. So Mark, want to tell us a little bit about these insurance companies. So clearly it's not going to last forever where they lose money. <laughs> yeah. So, so when this sort of first came about, the, the insurance companies were really just protecting us for a, a breach. Right. And, uh, and so they, and it typically, you know, you would offer uh, identity theft protection, that sort of thing. There was a certain amount of cost and it depended on whether people signed up for it. It was, it was sort of a lower cost outlay possible. Um, I remember in the past, I think the rule of thumb in higher ed was the um, engineering school compromise that Penn State University had suffered. So their active directory was completely compromised. They had to, to recover, shut down everything, sort of clean it all out, get back up and running. And that was the worst case type of example. And it ended up costing them about $3 million. Hmm. So when you started looking at your cyber insurance, you start saying, okay, we need to get covered for that up to $3 million sort of cost. Because it usually would not, I mean, it was rare to even get to that level. Right. <clears throat> Excuse me. 
And then, so you needed the coverage for that because it wouldn't go beyond that. You had to be a really big institution to be able to incur any more costs than that. Um, and that's changed. Now with, with the advent of, of really in-depth ransomware where they, uh, they even can get inside your systems and find out how much you're insured for and then ask for that amount. Mm -hmm. You know, the prices have just ballooned. Um, and so the cost to the insurance companies have just gotten outrageous because it's no longer a small cost, mostly with a technical perspective. It's, it's both the breach recovery and then also the holding ransom of the, uh, you know, pay us or we let your, your uh, information get out there onto the internet. Mm -hmm. So what I've heard from a lot of peers uh, in the education industry is they're just losing money hand over fist in the last two years. And that's yep. new. Yep. Yeah, another uh, stat is um, from Marsh, uh, Q3 Marsh did a combined several studies and said, you know, typically their direct loss ratio was 34%. So every, you know, every dollar that they brought in, they, they lost 34%. They estimate it now to be over 100%. So, and that doesn't include a hundred percent means they're absolutely losing money. That doesn't include any of their administrative sales costs, you know, all the back end processing, all that stuff. So, so it's significant again, that just that alone tripled as well. So, and, and a lot of it is just even the, the psychological damage done uh, for just everyone. And, you know, when you're hit with this, especially when it's something so drastic and so quick to an insurance industry, that's generally very slow, you know, process oriented building, it really, really shakes it up. All right, so what are they doing about it? Well, uh, they're starting to get a little bit more strict on uh, what constitutes a payable claim. So um, really, as you can see from the slide, deny, deny, deny. And what they're looking at there is, are you showing reasonable care for your environment? Uh, so there's very specific terms and conditions um, within your policies. And, uh, you know, that is called due care. So what you do care is considered would be like, what are the standards that your environment is maintained against? So this is going to be any sort of frameworks that, uh, that you have within your environment. Usually it is the NIST framework that they're looking at. Um, so they're, they're basically gonna make sure that what you're doing bumps up against your documented policies and processes to show that you're actually um, maintaining your environment regularly, monthly patching, what are your encryption standards? Do you have data backups? Are they air gapped? Are they immutable? Uh, things like that. So unless you're really keeping on top of a lot of those things, they're looking to basically try and save their money, uh, not putting a claim or not fulfilling a claim. Now, how you know in depth or how invasive have they started to become from from you know what you guys have seen from past lives or current lives? From the insurance side. From the insurance side. Typically, I mean, they're still doing questionnaires, uh, and we'll kind of get this into this a little bit later here too. They're you know you have the initial questionnaire that's coming out. So, but that's basically still the core of what. That's You're that's what out. we've seen so far, but really where it starts getting into detail is you need to do your due diligence on what is the risk to your company as well as what policies you want to sign up for. The T's and C's, there are so many different policies and riders out there. The terms and conditions on those vary. They, one policy might be good for someone in the retail space. Uh, a different policy might be good for somebody in the manufacturing space. That's just something that you have to work with your risk management teams uh, and your business leadership to determine which of these policies fit and what level do we want to uh, risk do we want to accept uh, based off this. We have actually a really good uh, comment from Phil. He says, um, just completed painful renewal process with broker who sold us a policy spread out between four uh, separate carriers to get us to the amount of coverage we need. One carrier said they would not quote us unless we had MFA in use inside the network for our privileged, privileged accounts. Microsoft AD doesn't even support on-premise MFA. It's, this is such a pain. So it is, it's, it's happening and, and, and way bigger than, than I thought. Now, in fairness, I will say that 
uh, talking to some of the brokers, they did say that there's not a lot of uh, uh, angry clients mm -hmm. from payments, um, from getting paid. But we're seeing more and more of it, of course, as they as they continue yeah. on. I think what, what I've heard also is, um, whereas before you would make a claim, and I've been in on a couple of things where we've, in, in various jobs where we've made claims, and it was never questioned. It was all, okay, yep, okay, we'll, we'll get started with that. Now they're starting to audit where they'll show up and say, okay, well, you're making this claim. Um, did you really have full disk encryption on that machine? They want to see the proof of that. Um, they may still be processing it, but then after the fact, you may get denied. So that's a real risk. In higher ed, that's a really significant risk because we don't just do one thing. You know, we do a hundred different things. So you might say, well, you've got a controlled machine. Is every single machine on your network controlled? Well, in an educational environment where we have students, they're using our network, right? They've mm -hmm. got our IP address. Are we controlling a student's machine? No, right? Because it's theirs. They own it. It's not part of the university, but it's on our network. So I think that's one of the other big challenges with this is that as they drill in, they're looking for more and more of a absolute answer. And where you're in an environment where you don't have just one thing that you're doing or one sort of image one type of server, et cetera, where you've got this real diversity of technologies and behaviors and activities. You know, we at, at Case Western, we have a, a, an internet researcher who hacks at the internet. So we ourselves might accidentally have a virus in play, right? That there's things going on. That's not your normal type of corporate environment. So when I fill out these questionnaires that are yes, no, it's really difficult. And that's mm -hmm. the other thing we're starting to see is a follow-up questionnaire. And then even a response beyond that, where, okay, you said yes to this. What are the caveats, right? It's a no, but, or a yes, but. And I think that's going to become more and more important over time as we try to flush out, okay, what is acceptable and what's not to the cyber insurance companies, not just to the security staff, right? And, and even the compliance people within the uh, organization. So we know that that's not going to last forever. Um, and really, this got started was, interestingly enough, typically we would see, you know, in the past, um, one of these three uh, happen, um, where you would have premiums increase, but that, you know, always happened, but not like this, and coverage cut, which actually probably didn't see as much in the past because they wanted more coverage so they could charge you more. Um, and then they had certain deductibles, certainly in the early days, I remember reviewing policies and, um, you know, people had really sort of middle insurance up to a million, they, they had to, uh, they insured then a million and 10 million, uh, or sorry, they didn't have insured a million to 10 million, they had insured and then over 10 million, uh, they, um, they, they didn't as well. So it didn't make, and it was a couple hundred grand for that. So, you know, it was pretty expensive. But now you were saying you're seeing what premiums, you know, cut in half or uh, yeah, uh, coverage is cut in half, uh, deductibles raised. I mean, it's it's been it's been amazingly stark in the way that these changes have come about uh, and, and even some some people finding coverages. I think so. The worst I've heard from some of the peers, I mean, most people are talking about it's doubling in cost, right? Um, I think we had a couple of people who said, nope, it's actually four times what it cost before. So uh, those prices are definitely jumping up. Yep. So, yeah, so we have a cold poll there. Just wanted to see where everyone is. Um, if you've been a part of it, where have you, where are you seeing your uh, uh, coverages increase? Kind of get a good gauge on, on where that is and see, you know, what are people uh, seeing out in their own environments? Give a second to look at that. One other item too. I mean, not only are coverages increasing, but as you've seen in some um, some reporting out there, they're actually being um, pushed. Some underwriters are being pushed not to offer policies. Anymore yep. Related to it, they're actually they're saying no more just because the risk is so high. So, will the market contract that it's only going to be a few providers? And as that comment came through. Uh, online, we've seen that from multiple clients of ours that um, during certain engagements, we're seeing where they are having multiple policies through multiple providers just to be able to meet certain risk factors. Um, so it's it, it, it continues to evolve uh, day after day. 
So what have you seen, Mark? I mean, you know, in this, in this, uh, oh, let's, let's uh, go to our poll. So um, looks like it's actually kind of fairly evenly spread. Most people are seeing between 50% or 100% increase. Um, next is less than 50%, which is great. And then some are seeing, you know, well over 100%. And a couple people are seeing 300% increase. Yeah, I think that uh, four times outlier <laughs> is an outlier, but hopefully it'll, it stays an outlier. Yeah. I mean, because it's the, the overall cost increases, the coverage decreases, and then the du deductible increases. So it's hard to really say in a linear way, it's mm -hmm. only twice as much. Right, you know? right, right. That's, that's a good point. Right. Because when they all come together, plus you have the increase, I mean, you, it's even harder to compare. Yep. So I think the other thing that's new is we're starting to see that uh, the insurance companies are backing off of everything that they cover. So on the screen now, you've got an example. This is a uh, from France. Right. So it's a, it's a headline that shows, well, the insurers are now saying that, look, regardless of what you're insured for, we're not going to pay the ransomware bid. Right. And a little bit later in the slideshow, we'll get into what cyber insurance all covers. But this is something that's new, too. So one of the ways to control costs is, well, we won't pay for everything. So if, you're, if your cyber insurer refuses to pay ransom and it's an amount of ransom you can't afford, you're going to have to go back to the, uh, the ransomware group and tell them, Look, we just can't afford this. We don't have the money. You know, that's a hard choice to then, because what if they don't right. accept your answer? What do you do? Right, right. So, and I think the next slide is the same thing. There's a different example of, um, a, this is a Canadian insurance company. I don't know which one it was. Um, but this is an example of they're actually making a carve out. So the, another piece of, of your liability insurance is often your property insurance. Mm -hmm. So whether you're gonna get, like if somebody falls on the sidewalk kind of thing and they sue you for whatever damages, that's generally covered by your cyber insurance policy. So on the one side, we're seeing the cyber insurance policies maybe not covering everything. Now we're seeing other insurance parts say if it's cyber insurance related, it's no longer covered under your umbrella coverage. So you need to still have that rider. So I think this is kind of an interesting, you might see a gap develop here where all your other insurance says you need to have cyber insurance to cover that. And then the cyber insurance says, okay, well, you've got our insurance, but we're not gonna cover these aspects of it. There could be a gap. So there's a new risk I think involved as we've tried to figure out what are the cyber insurance companies gonna be happy with and what are they gonna charge for? Okay, so, so for those of you, who, again, a good, good majority of you have gotten into the policies and, and so you're pretty familiar probably with what uh, some of this is. And you know, when I look at policies, it's, it's really getting confusing. So some of it was just naming you know, at, the, at the beginning, early on, retention, deductible. You know, we're all used to deductibles on our car insurance, we call it retention. Some other terms like this fraud instruction, what was that, you know, what is that all about? It's, it's, it's kind of like, and again, there's no probably one-to-one, -one, but you know, it's, it's pretty well equated to uh, social engineering. But then we get into some of these uh, what I call word jumbles, and and I, I don't know if I should read it or not because <laughs> even reading it is hard for me just to read it, not even trying to understand it. Um, but if you take a look at what they're describing as a data breach, the theft, loss, or unauthorized disclosure of person identifiable information or third party information that is in care, custody, or control of the insured organization or a third party for whose theft, loss, or unauthorized disclosure of personal identifiable information or third-party information, the insured organization is liable. So that's your definition of a data breach. So you would hope that that covers most of it, but it still gets like, okay, did we have a, did we actually have a data breach or did we not? Um, was it, you know, and, and some of it is like, again, what is considered a data breach? You know, you brought up that good example of your student. Is that considered a breach or is that not considered a breach if they you know run some some virus on your own you know on your own systems for research mm -hmm. so um it's kind of kind of an interesting thing so you you definitely have to get into to it to some degree now again we come from a, a security perspective so what we're really saying here is you do have to work with legal but you know you have to at least come to some point on these terms that when they're using them, particularly in your own policy, and this probably is even more difficult when you, you know, have 
for policies is, as uh, Phil said, you know, how, how do you, you know, everyone is going to have their own terminology and use it differently. Um, and then <clears throat> I've seen these confusing amendments where there's an exclusion that provides affirmative coverage for a part that was excluded in a previous exclusion. And so you're like, okay, so double, you know, double negative, cross the, take the T, you know. So it, it's just like, okay, I have to read that a bunch of times. Then you have to go back. Um, and some of these policies, and hopefully it's starting to get cleared up now or cleaned up with brand new policies, but they were just continuing to add on. So they're adding on amendments after amendments. Um, and so the original verbiage doesn't make any sense anymore. It doesn't work. They re, you know, they rewrote what that definition means and they have another policy. So it can be like a hundred page. A policy now could be a hundred page. The smallest I've won, the smallest one I've seen is, is was fairly new uh, that they got and it was only, you know, five pages. It was great. You know, you can get through it, but some of these, you know, those of you who are in larger companies or have had that kind of insurance for a long time, it takes a while to get through it. So just kind of know again, from a security perspective, we're not saying you have to know these inside and out like a legal professional or like your risk officer or CFO, which, you know, even they probably may, may or may not understand what they're, what they're signing up for, you know, some of the, some of these terms, but um, at least, you know, have some sort of base knowledge when you get into this and, and maybe have a cheat sheet for yourself uh, when you go into the discussions. Yeah, we used to talk a lot about how um, it's really important for security practitioners to know the business language. Mm -hmm. And so it was always about, don't, don't talk about attack. Don't talk about right. susceptibility. Talk about risk yep. right? and translate everything into terms of risk. Well, that's not enough anymore. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, the first time I heard retention, I had no idea what they were. I was like, is that like a deductible? And they were, oh yes, yes. In fact, yeah. it is a deductible. Right, right. Right. So I'm looking at it from a consumer perspective. You know, since then I've been in a number of the meetings where we talk about this and it really, yeah, you should be doing that MBA thing, but you maybe even get into accounting. Right, because mm -hmm. the finance and the insurance terms are now sort of making their way into the security world, which means we need to make our way into that world as well. Yeah. So the language is changing. Um, you know, it's not just risk anymore; it's also finance. So, so actually, it's interesting as you've kind of moved up, and although you've been a CISO for a few years now, right? Mm -hmm. But as you kind of built, you know, moved up, how is and and I know this is new, but how has it kind of changed in your interactions? You know, even in your, you know, couple of different um, places, your interactions with other, you know, execs or, you know, how much, you know, if you're a director, for example, should you be getting into this or should you, you know, is it not really necessary? You know, where, when do you see like this starting to pop up? Well, so when we first got started with this, um, and it was, you know, my first job as a CISO, as it were, was thanks to you, Steve. You know, you sort of pointed me out to a, to a hospital nearby that I, I went to, and I was director of information security. That was the pinnacle of security at the time. It was not an executive director. It was not an assistant VP, not a C layer. I mean, the CISO title has really only been around for about 10 years, mm -hmm. right? While the CIO has been, what, 30 years or so? Uh, it really kicked off in the 90s as things really started getting, or I don't think so much in the 80s, but the 90s when everything started getting computerized. So it's a pretty well-established role. So where I think we've seen a difference is when I was in that director of information security role, I really only talked to the CIO, right? Uh, or whoever my boss was, which was the CIO at the time. What's different now is with that escalation. Oh, and, and then if we had an incident, it would often be, you know, tens of dollars, at least you know, hundreds of dollars might get into the thousands. So the amount of risk was really something that a director level could sign off on, right? Mm -hmm. Oh, we need to call in, uh, you know, trusted sec, we need to sign a check for $1,500 or whatever it is. Okay, you know, or even $25,000. That sort of kept it at that lower level. Now the risk level has changed. If we're ending up having to pay out millions of dollars, you know, that's when you're starting to get into that assistant vice president or even vice president level, mm -hmm. right? It's getting up to the president or CEO. So that makes it different when the conversation is happening about what does this mean? The people in the room are a different group of people. So I've found over time, not just during an incident response where I might be talking to the COO to say, hey, here's what we're doing. We're working on this right now. This system's coming back up. Here's where we are, sort of an, an operational update, right? Now it's in the planning phases too, mm -hmm. where we start to do the tabletop exercises. We actually talk through, okay, who's doing this? Who's doing that? Um, it's a different level, right? So it is that executive level. 
And I think that's a significant change in the last five years. And I think it really has been driven by ransomware. Mm -hmm. It's just the risk in terms of money has added a zero to the end, right? <laughs> it's gone from hundreds or thousands or hundreds of thousands of dollars to possibly into the millions or right. even tens of millions. Mm -hmm. And that can put the company out of business, Sure. right? If you're out a hundred thousand dollars, you're business probably isn't going to go under, but if you're out 10 million, if you're a small business, you're done. Yeah. And we have heard of that too. Yeah. Yeah. I, from what I, what I've kind of seen um, more and more IT in general, integrating into understanding the business is just how it keeps going because used to, you know, starting out, it was, you know, everybody was sitting in a room. Okay. They're the computer guys. They're sitting there hanging away. Well, everything now is distributed. So you've got SaaS solutions. So the majority of the people that are operating or managing these applications are less working on the, uh, you know, development or things like that. They're, they're really building process in these applications related to business. So, and that just scales up. So in order to have teams that do this, your leadership and IT needs to understand what are the problems the business have? Mm -hmm. What are the processes the business follows? So I, I see it really driving through the leadership of IT is that, you know, it's the digital age. It's never going back to the stone age. Right. You know, okay. it's going to be more and more and more. Everybody's now got a supercomputer in their hand with their cell phone. Yep. Yep. And so IT is everybody's business now. It's not just one little function. So it is the business. It's going to keep going and going and going. And I think you'll see more and more that a lot of these roles are going to be sort of split managed between, yes, you have your IT function of security, but you're also going to have there's a business function that you need to be aware of and managing. And that's where sort of this technology, or not the technology, the terminology. That we're talking about here, where you're going to be need, you will be the one that has to sift through this mm -hmm. and be able to apply business terms to technical terms and be the ones that talk to the executives and fill those blanks in to help make an educated decision or know who to talk to, right? Exactly. So you may end up now being the broker, as it were, in a meeting between IT and those other business units, whereas they used to just do the things on their mm -hmm. own. You know, they would have a separate meeting completely from IT. And I think COVID has driven some of this as well with the, uh, you sure. know, IT is really now a partnership if you have to do remote work. It's not, I mean, because if it used to be that if your remote work was down, well, just drive on in, you know, and that's not an option. So now you've suddenly got a different dependency going on for the CIOs too. So this next point is, has it become worthless? So we have all these problems that are denying claims, more money, you know, less coverage, things have gotten so crazy, you know, now as security people. And what's interesting about that, and, and we'll talk about a little bit later, but, you know, the skill set that you have to have as a, a security person now, I think is, is, is a lot of what you guys were talking, as you said, with the business. But is it time to just self-insure? So is it time to say, hey, we can't, you know, this is just more than we can afford for the coverage, let alone, you um, you know, let alone if we have a loss. So should we, you know, really look at, you know, changing the way that we spend? Yeah. And I think that's a, that's each company obviously has to ask themselves that and figure out where that level of tolerance is. Um, one of the things that's very interesting in higher ed, especially in a research institution, is we have grants uh, or we've made agreements with different groups where either we've given them mm -hmm. data or we've gotten data from them and we're working on it. Some of those data use agreements include a requirement to have cyber insurance, right? Because those are written a year ago, two years ago, five years ago. So there's an assumption at which at the time it was fairly inexpensive. There's an assumption that you've got it. Mm -hmm. So if it's not a simple question of, okay, well, we're, we've decided we're going to go self-insure. Right. If we, there's a, sorry, if there are a bunch of contracts out there, which is what grants essentially are, the agreements of some sort, um, you then need to go back through those and make sure it's okay to do it or at least go back through and find out if there was a stipulation as to how much that cyber insurance needed to cover. Because if in the past it covered $5 million and now based on paying the same amount, it's way down to $1 million. Was there a clause in the agreement that said you need to have $3 million, yep. right? So the smart thing is you, you get rid of the value of the amount that would be in there so that you're not tied to a dollar value and you just sort of agree that you will have cyber insurance that's sufficient 
for the predicted risks. Mm -hmm. right. and, and, and you're right. And the third parties, I mean, they just assume, you know, show us your cyber liability insurance policy. Yeah. And some of it's from the state. Uh, in a previous role, I was at, at a public university and it didn't matter. The state had a requirement for the mm -hmm. university that you've got to have cyber insurance. So it didn't matter whether we wanted to be self-insured or not. Uh, we had an obligation coming down from the state to do so. But from, you know, even from a business perspective or, or you know, commercial, have you seen, you know, any discussions about it or, you know, within the organizations you've been consulting for or came yeah. from? Yeah, the, um, I mean, just personal experience. I mean, we've, we've had that conversation um, a few times just with the premiums that were going up. Uh, you know, really, we had to sit down and say, because before a lot of the, it's looked at as it's sort of like that safety net. Mm -hmm. Hey, it happened. You know, right. we had transferred risk. Yeah. yeah, we're we don't have to do X, Y, Z or invest this amount of money in something else because we have this now. It's like a get out of jail free card, but it's really not that. Yep. Um, so there's a lot of that expectation with it. But we started looking at this risk and saying, okay, with the deductible being this, and you know, eventually what does it really equal or save us money? The, our policy, because you have to assume your policy is there's a cap on it. Mm -hmm. So when you have to decide, okay, they're going to cover up to this much amount. Is it worth even purchasing or is it worth just building controls, building processes, and then following up that way to say, we've put this money into this that doesn't guarantee, obviously, that you're protected or not, but you look at it, you're investing some other way. So there, it's conversations that are going on all over uh, with the way that the market's being driven because mm -hmm. you're getting, you're paying more, you're getting less. Does, does it really make sense to put the money into that or does it make sense to put it elsewhere? We have actually a really good question uh, or, or yeah, question from John it says, do you feel like the insurance people you deal with are helpful? Uh, do they truly understand what insurance does, does not cover, and are they able to clearly articulate coverage concepts like data breach in language that non-insurance people can understand? So uh, my experience with the insurance folks have always been very helpful. Yeah. Where we get issues, I think, is where there is a mismatch. So exactly like, you know, this, this expectation that every single machine is just like every other machine in the university is just not true. Mm -hmm. But so that can be hard to explain mismatch in their understanding right so their expectation is you only have one type of computer right i see you only have one type you have an image you have the same software on every single computer and everybody kind of uses it the same way mm -hmm. right and so then and that i think gets back to those the, the problems with the questionnaires too that you know they ask a simple yes no question and the answer is it depends mm -hmm. right and maybe and the answer is always yes and always also no right, right. <laughs> so so how do you deal with that and so i think that's where that mismatch is coming on in actually, I mean, during an event in talking to the people uh, um, in the couple of events that I've been involved in where we've activated our cyber insurance, um, it's always been very helpful. It's, it's, it's been very sort of ops oriented. Let's get it done. Here are the names of people that you can call. Here's what, here's what the next steps are. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't think on a practical level, it's ever been a problem. It's always in right. that sort of planning and assessment piece where the expectations from a cybersecurity uh, insurer are applied to lots of different industries at once. You know, they don't just specialize in higher ed, mm -hmm. right? And higher ed is a very, very different kind of organization than a lot of the other ones. I, I, and I think it's with everything that, you know, you could have good experience, bad experience. You know, it, it really depends on who you're working with or speaking with, uh, that you could have somebody that, yeah, I sell cybersecurity insurance and, you know, they don't really know what it equals. Um, so I think that just comes down to looking to find the right provider for you and, uh, you know, making sure that they are, uh, you know, able to answer your questions. And I would say if they're not able to answer your questions, then that's probably a telling thing of you might need to go look elsewhere. Well, and I think that's actually one of the things that's happening in the industry right now is there's a kind of a shakeout where mm -hmm. the mm -hmm. insurance underwriters or companies who had a certain idea of what it's like are starting to realize oh, it doesn't work that way, right? That's yep. that sort of mismatch reality is, and that's why they're losing money is because they had a prediction of how things would run. So I think some of those people are getting out of the business at the same time. So uh, we have a poll question up on Bitcoin and uh, 
just your experience uh, for both of you from your you know organizations uh, that your came from. Are they getting Bitcoin uh, or investing in it uh, or looking to a company like Trusted Sec to make sure, hey, do you guys have this? And you know, if we get in trouble, are you able to pay for it? You want to start? Oh, sorry, I was. No, all... <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. So, so I told you what my closed plan, yet. My, what my plan used to be for Bitcoin. You know, yeah, that, yeah. that thing has fallen by the wayside. Off of my well, not if you got in that thirty-five you know? box. That was that was pretty good. So really so, good. So what what Why I think what's happened is the cybersecurity uh, insurance companies have actually been the broker. So in in our particular case, right now, no, uh, we don't have an institutional wallet set up. But what we do have is. With the cybersecurity insurance company, um, we they would then broker it for us, right? And I think that's probably a really good way to go anyway. I mean, one of the concerns with having Bitcoin, first of all, is what if they don't ask for Bitcoin? Mm-hmm. You got to go get something else. Um, or what if the Bitcoin suddenly drops in half and what they're asking is a value of Bitcoin, not a number of Bitcoin, right? So, so let's say you have Bitcoin worth half a million dollars right now and they ask for half a million dollars worth of Bitcoin, but yesterday the, the market dropped, mm-hmm. right? Then you got to scramble and go get more. So I think what you want to have is the ability to be able to get it. Um, and so you either do it yourself if you've got the expertise in the house, and then you're kind of fighting like, which, which kind of wallet? Do I need Ethereum, right? Do I need something right, else? Right. Or you work with a company then uh, and get that assurance in place that you've got somebody that either already has wallets and you're going to give them the money and they'll just buy more Bitcoin and put it in there for you, right? And, and mm-hmm. sort of process the payment or who knows how to get those wallets for you and set it up. Because that's, I mean, that's like registering your domain names in the old days, right? Uh, like we, in the IT staff, we registered the company's name. Well, then a person who's na- who owned the, d- the domain left. Mm-hmm. So if it's my Bitcoin wallet and I leave, well, the institution's got a problem, then, right? <laughs> right? Right, so, right. So you got to keep that in mind too, is who's going to own the wallet? Mm-hmm. So look at the results. I mean, 91% do not have a method of payment set up. We had a question, typically, is it moving over to Monero or is that uh, just his understanding? I haven't heard too much of different coins too much. I've seen a couple stories about it that I think there was one ransom instance where they asked for something different. Because remember, there was a big scare suddenly that Bitcoin could be tracked, Mm -hmm. right? And then there was a jump over to a different kind. I see. Oh, that was the that was the reason. That was the push. I see. Well, that's interesting. So yeah, um, we we'll kind of see what's happening there. Okay. So what should we do as security uh, professionals? And it really comes down to you know to to three different things. And one is get up to speed on those insurance policies and options. Again, from a you know from from a different perspective, which we'll touch on. What are the precautions you can take, and how do you build a risk based discussion mechanism? Uh, which I'll talk about what that is. So, so Mark, uh, tell us the, these three coverages. Uh, I know you've you've talked about this a little bit with us, but you know w- what what is this about? Yeah, sorry, this is a lot of words. This is one of my slides, right? So, you know, I'm a wordy <laughs> person. So I started talking about like there's. It's interesting. I think there's three halves, right? There's three things you have to have, right? And so what I did was I kind of drilled down. There's three halves and then there's three more halves. So this is the first half. And it was kind of a joke on like what kind of coverage have we got? Like, has it doubled? Is it cut in half? So one of the things that's really interesting about cyber insurance itself is the way it has evolved. So there's really three big things. When you talk about cyber insurance, it's not just one thing Mm -hmm. that they do. They do three really big things, right? They cover breach alerting and forensics. So this is the original Uh, cyber insurance. This is how it first got started was when you had a breach, you had to know what to do. You had to alert people. So let's say there's, you had a system with 150,000 records in it. Well, you needed to somehow get a hold of those 150,000 people. You needed to set up a call center, right? You needed to send them letters. Uh, Depending on what state you're in and which law applied or rule, you had to alert in different ways. So you had to figure out how to do that. Um, at the same time, you needed to, from a security ops perspective, you needed to get a scope. Like, was it only that system? You needed really good assurance that the breach only went so far and it only affected this amount of information. And so therefore the pool of people who need to be alerted are only this pool of people. As mm-hmm. opposed to, let's say you have 3 million records total. It's only the 150,000 people who were affected by this particular problem. Yep, yep. So that's what the cybersecurity insurance was originally set up to cover. Plus then you would extend identity theft protection, 
right? Because if you remember six, seven years ago, most people didn't have that. Right. That was an unusual thing. Now I've seen it bundled in with health insurance, you know, that you get it as part of it. So a lot of people now already have it either from a previous breach that may have occurred or um, through an insurance provider or even their, uh, their employer. So that changed. So, so that was a piece. So, so when you call, when you activated your cybersecurity insurance, that's one of the things they covered. What's new uh, is they now have to also deal with ransom and response, right? Because when it was $30 and I was going to go drive and get some Bitcoin, the insurance company didn't have to worry about that. Now, when it's millions of dollars, you know, that's another cost that we're looking to, you know, the risk that gets transferred to insurance. That's another cost that institutions are looking to have the cyber insurance pay for, right? And then also the response. So if we look at some of the uh, examples of where there has been a ransomware attack, um, if all of the workstations were infected, you have to install a piece of software to clean it off of every single workstation or set up a team, bring every single workstation in or laptop and re-image the thing, mm -hmm. right? And so you got to pay for the hourly fees on that. So if you're installing an endpoint detection and response client, there's a licensing cost for that. So there's some real hard costs, which didn't really affect you back in the old days where you would just wipe it out and reload it. Now you have to actually recover. So those are two, so that's really new to the current age of the, uh, the insurance. And I think that's one of the things that's driving these, these changes in the, uh, the costs of insurance and the coverage amount. The third thing though, and this is one that you might forget about, and we did refer to it a little bit when we looked at that example from the Canadian company, where they're no longer, the, the property insurance, the liability insurance are no longer covering a claim if it has a cyber insurance piece to it, right? So what you're seeing more and more now is after breach, after everything's settled, now there's a class action lawsuit, mm. right? And so if that's still related to the breach, the cyber insurers don't didn't realize they were going to be covering that too, mm. right? So those are the three halves. When you think about cybersecurity insurance and you say, you know what, I'm going to go self-insure, you got to keep in mind, you're not just doing breach alerting and forensics anymore. And you're not necessarily just doing ransom and response. You might also be getting into the, oh, okay, we've got a multi-million dollar class action lawsuit coming down the pipe, mm. right? So it's, it's very easy to say I'm self-insured, but you got to realize, and this is where the CFO, uh, you know, the, 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 biz, the executives really do get involved in risk management, is you got to realize what the big picture is from that. So what about the services? You said there's two services that um, you need to be aware of. Well, that's on the, the next. Yep. Yep. So yeah, sorry, these are the things. I'm, I'm one slide behind, <laughs> so I just caught up. So there are two services um, that, that you get when you do it, right? You get reimbursement or cost coverage for anything you've paid out, right? So that's pretty simple. That's normally what you would do with insurance is you would call them up and say, hey, I've been in a car accident. This is what's going on. Uh, this is what they say it's going to take to fix it. Um, they'll cut a check and either send it right to the car repair place and pay for it, or you pay for it, and then they reimburse you for those costs. Mm -hmm. So that's the straightforward piece. What a lot of people don't realize is that that cyber insurance company is also acting as a first responder coordination for you, right? So that's the second service, and that's where the other three halves is, I think. Um, they will actually, when you activate it under a cyber insurance claim, they would then bring a team to bear. Right. They've been through it before. So they knew how what steps to call. They knew who in they had a legal team that could then go through and analyze, OK, what states are involved in this breach and what are the laws in each one of those breaches? Uh, they had a num They typically had a number of um, cybersecurity professional companies, right, like a trusted sec mm -hmm. that you, they had a discounted rate. So you had a guarantee that they'd be available to you as if you were paying them a retainer. Mm -hmm. Right. Because the cyber insurance company basically had them on call. Um, and then they also gave you a discounted rate. So if you decide to go self-insured, you got to keep in mind, you now are responsible for picking that up again. Mm -hmm. So that's what it was like in the days before cyber insurance and, and the breaches became big, was we used to have a, a cyber response third-party team on call paying a retainer on an annual basis to make sure we could activate and that when we called, they were there for us. We wouldn't be put off for you know a week or something because they were busy with something else. So when you look at the response and triage services, the, the other three halves, okay, it, it's incident response and expert resources. So just like uh, a cyber insurance company 10 years ago, you bring them in, they're, they're technical experts, they deal with something. But what's also new now is executive breach coaching, hmm. 
right? Do the executives know what they need to do in the, the event of a ransomware attack? So that's really going to help us as uh, security individuals, you would think. Yeah, I mean, because and typically when these ransomwares come in, you've got what, 24, 48 maybe hours to respond, right. maybe three days if you're lucky. Um, so somebody has to have already thought through these things and know what kind of decision to make. Like, again, do you have a, a cryptocurrency wallet? Mm -hmm. uh, what do you, what's that, right? Mm -hmm. um, so the, that executive breach coaching, I think, is an important piece to keep in mind that they do that for you. So if you're going to go self-insured, you want to make sure you already are doing it yourself or you have somebody on call for that same kind of thing. So would you recommend like if you, you know, most people are not probably self-insured yet. And I would gather that, you know, they're just starting to think about it. Most organizations or CEOs, but would you as a, again, security person get involved in the policy or get involved in insurance a little bit more to see like what types of, you know, what you can take advantage of there? Because I, I agree, one of the biggest things is still, you know, working with the executives and getting them to understand, number one, the cost, but then also what we're going to, which we'll talk about in a second, what we're going to have to do as a result. Yeah, because, because I mean, what will happen is they'll turn back to you and say, yep. okay, what do we need to do? Yep. Which means yep. you got to have the answers. Yep. So that's where you do need to, if you're in those planning type meetings, if you're aware of the vocabulary, mm -hmm. you know, you know, these are, oh, these are the kinds of things that have affected other people that you have to kind of keep in mind. Um, I think that is an important piece. And like we do, we do a lot of tabletops. Yeah, so exactly. So with um, knowing what you're getting, you know, because I, I've seen um, that in, you know, some past engagements where uh, somebody has been breached, it's deemed that it's not a coverable claim. They brought in their uh, forensic team and they basically discovered it wasn't a, they, they didn't remediate the breach. They basically came in and said, okay, it was a breach. Here's a check. And they're like, great, but their business is still down. Mm -hmm. So that they're scrambling to figure out how to fix it. So understanding everything that's in that rider of what are the benefits I get? Because one of the biggest things too, that I would suggest here with uh, the tabletops that you're getting with your insurance company of this executive coaching is you should also have a tabletop around what if our claim is denied? Because then you're going to be on your own doing these things again, like you are self-insured. Sure. So you don't want to all of a sudden go in, then you get your claim denied and you're left having no idea exactly what you need to do next. Yeah, and I think some of these cyber, if you are cyber still insured with a cyber company, some of them do offer these, but you got to ask for it. Mm -hmm. So you got to think to ask for it. They will come out and do the tabletop exercises with you because it reduces their cost in the long run. It's actually in their interests to do them. So the other piece that I wanted to get into was um, they will provide ransomware negotiation itself, right? So one of the one of the, the horror stories of a ransomware infection is that you pay the ransom and then you don't get the decryptor or it doesn't work, right? Or it takes longer than just recovering it yourself. So one of the things I've heard that you start to you need to start looking at is it's it's part by part ransomware payment, right? Oh, okay, well I'll pay you a third of the ransom, but only after you demonstrate that you actually have my data mm -hmm. and that you can decrypt that third. So once you've decrypted a third, then I'll pay for the rest of it, right? That kind of thing. And so there are now professional ransomware negotiators who will step in on your part and help both lower the overall ransom asked for and make sure that once you, if you do pay it, once it's paid for, they don't just run away and get you, it, right? right? But, so that it, it's really interesting. It's a whole cottage industry, I think, of, of making sure that the ransom gets paid in a way that assures that you are able to recover. So, so, so of course, we know, you know, backups. T tell us a little bit about, you know, just briefly, we don't have to get into all the details, but just some of the things that are, you know, happening in that. Yes. In that so as mentioned before, uh, you know, two part. There's going to be a more technical uh, webinar on this coming up in January, so tune in. Um, but really, I mean, is it all about backups? Sort of, but not. I mean, so it's where you keep your data, but it, it's really um, you need to protect your data um, with your backups. So whether it be they're air gapped, uh, you have cold storage, or they're immutable. So immutable, they can't be changed. Uh, after the fact for a certain period of time, uh, air gapped, you know, they are not on the network. So if things are compromised, these 
backups aren't accessible, so you can't have any lateral movement to get to them. But it, again, this all comes back down to multiple other controls that you have to look at because great, you have your backups, but they got in somehow. Um, you need to start going through uh, some sort of framework and implementing that in your environment that basically stops your last resort from needing to be your last resort. Mm -hmm. So that, that's really the thing, implementing tool sets, implementing policies, following processes, uh, all of those things um, are just very good hygiene when it comes to your environment. And, the and they still matter. Here. Yeah, very much so. Yeah, and we're also, I mean, the various storage providers, backup providers, et cetera, are starting to say, hey, we've got a product for this immutability. We've got mm -hmm. a ransomware sure. resilience product. Ask them about it, look into it, because mm -hmm. you may really want it. I mean, especially if you're getting into like deduplicated backups, you know, if you mess that up anywhere in the chain, everything, it hinges upon that original one bit that's right. not that's right. not the right. duplicate, right? Well, if that bit gets changed, every backup is bad, yeah. right? That has it in it. So. So look at the solutions that they're offering and watch out for the costs they may have too. This, this isn't necessarily a free add-on. Yeah, I mean, and there are some that you could that you might even be leveraging today that it's just a configuration item. In the past, I've seen where um, you know we we had no solution and it was really just turning on immutable backups within the solution that we had. Um, but yeah, so it, it could be an add-on price. It might even be something that you're able to do today that you know if done correctly, gives you that little bit extra security. Yeah, and then make sure you prove that it worked. Yes, <laughs> test your backups, test your restores. So this kind of touched on uh, this next thing, and, I, and, and um, I know we all wanted an answer for these, but it's probably more along the lines of, you know, can you answer these or do you have an answer? Um, uh, Mark, you had a good one with, do you have EDR? You're asked, do you have EDR? Yeah, so we got asked that by ours, and then, and the answer was yes. And then, but then we started drilling into it, right? Well, which EDR? What do you mean by EDR, right? So one of the problems we have is that the technology itself is changing. Mm -hmm. You know, um, right? Antivirus <clears throat> and endpoint detection and response client today is not the same <clears throat> thing it was a year ago. It's not the same thing it was a year before that. Yep. So what qualifies as an EDR is is actually in flux, which means you need to keep up on it as well. Right. So, so yeah, I think one of the big things was you just start making your own list of questions. Mm -hmm. When you go through one of these tabletop exercises, there's usually a deliverable if you're doing it as a formal thing where you come up with playbooks and it says what everybody's going to do. If all you do is just come through questions, that puts you way ahead of the game because at least you started thinking about it. Right. And again, like have we even got a crypto wallet and whose is it? <laughs> and I think a big part of this too is you know, some of these are going to be the questions. If, you, if you're doing a questionnaire that's coming in for new policy, I mean, you need to be able to answer these and you should also answer them truthfully because in the end, if you fudge the numbers and you do have a breach and they come back and they find out that, oh yeah, you said, yes, I have an EDR, but you have it on one system and you have 2000 that don't have it then they're not going to, they're going to deny your claim. So at that, at that point, you're not doing yourself any favors. So you really need to take a look at that questionnaire, not necessarily as a, um, you know, really a hindrance. It should be something that you guys look to apply to your environment that while we saw earlier with the MFA requirement that they put in there that, yeah, how do you do this when it's not doable? Um, you know, that right. you can apply these things and it, it's for your own good in the long run. Yeah, the questionnaire ends up becoming a security framework. Mm -hmm. You know, you end up having to, to actually manage your security implementation to it. Yeah, and that, that kind of leads us to the next point. And, um, and it's really building a risk system. And again, it's, it's more about this vehicle to speak to them. So there are different questions. And, and again, you know, we don't have to get in all of them as we're running up against some time here, but, you know, should you quantify, it doesn't even matter anymore. So if you, you know, if an insurance company comes in and it is now your framework, does risk management even matter? And how do you, you know, make it? Because so, if they ask you to do everything, you have to do that. We, we had a third party assessment that basically took uh, NIST 853 with every single control and just said, here, tell us, you know, do you have every single control in 853, which it was never meant to be. 
Um, and it still matters, of course, and it's still important. It's still good to have those conversations. But in some way, you have to be able to, to talk to um, your management about risk. Yeah, agreed. I mean, it comes back to you have to play the line between technology and business. And typically, um, you might have some well-versed techni uh, technical executives on the business side, but mm -hmm. you might not. You might be in a vertical that they are way removed from technology and they, they don't understand it. So you have to be able to play both sides of that to be able to talk in their terms, you know, this, this is what we need and why, but also to take whatever they give you and quantify that into building whatever option you're giving them. And when it comes to cyber insurance too, again, they're, the, the CFO is going to be much more familiar with that than they are with the tactical security mm -hmm. or, you know, when it gets real, like, okay, you know, we have this much money for cyber insurance and how much money do we need for security? You know, then well, what are you going to do with it? And is that going to stop us? And we get in all these different questions. I think that's where that I think that's where the false sense of security comes in. Sometimes it's looked at as I have cyber insurance. That means I don't have to buy an EDR. I don't have to spend the money on this. Why am I spending so much money on cyber security when I have cyber insurance? One does not replace the other. Sure. They it is merely a bolt on of everything else that you are putting in. So to me, that's where you might, if you lower your coverage of some sort within cyber insurance, you might need to up some controls to mitigate for specific higher risk items, but typically you're not going to see the need for one completely diminish while the other one goes up. Like they're, they're usually pretty low. Yep. Okay. So considerations in the event of an attack. Do you, so this is, yeah, I got ahead of myself. So, so this is where you ask yourself these questions. Do That's you right. have everything? Everything. We talked about a lot of this stuff. Do you have it all? And, I'll, and then there's that whole 800-53 reference too from NIST. That's a control catalog of what, 275 controls? Yeah. Or at least that was five years ago. I don't know where it is now. It's, right. You know, it's a lot. things never get smaller. Exactly. Right? So now it's probably 300 and some things. Do you have all of that? Because they may be asking you for that. Okay. And if not, then the next step is all right, what are the gaps? So, what all do you need? So, the tabletop type exercises, even just talking through it, will help you start to realize oh, yeah, we need to have these people on retainer because nobody's going to coordinate for us. Right. Uh, it's, it's interesting that we've sort of jumped back 10 years in our needs. Mm -hmm. The cyber insurance companies kind of covered us and acted on our behalf for a while. And now we may be back and out of it again. Um, can you do them all yourself? Right. That's a really big question. If you need to call in every single laptop that your company owns and install a piece of EDR software on it, can you do it? Are you a one person shop and there's no way you can do it? Right. You've got 2000 salespeople all over the world. What are you going to do with that? Right. Yeah. Um, and then again, there's the question, are you ready? And so there it is. Wouldn't it be nice to have at least a set of questions to get started? And I've actually been asking my peers and things, who's got a list of these questions? And, and the answers are all over the place. Nobody, right? Yeah. We all have our own questions. So I think it's really important to sort of to sit in your, organ, your institution and start asking yourself. And even if you don't have the answers, at least create the list of questions that you're going to ask if something goes wrong. You know, whether it's a meteor strike that affects one system and just a couple systems or something that has now gotten into your directory services and the whole institution is shut down. And how long is it going to be shut down for? Right. And if we're shut down for, let's say it takes you three weeks to recover. If you're shut down hard for three weeks, what are your staff members going to do? If you have hourly employees, they're not going to get paid. Right. You're going to send them home. There's no work to do. Now, if you have salaried uh, employees, are you going to pay them or not? Right. So a lot of it is it's just like COVID in some ways, right? Are you going to send people home? How are they going to work from there, et cetera? So these are really good questions to it's start real. putting together for yourself. Are we ready for this? All right. Well, I want to thank everybody for their time. Thank you all for joining and thanks for sticking around with us. Um, Again, you know, if there's anything else, and I know we, we ran a little over, so definitely, you know, the rest of the questions 
I might not have been able to get to them all, but wanted to just, you know, give you a chance to reach out anytime, anything that we can do for you, you know, we're always here. I always say one of the, the greatest thing about Trust and Second, if you just have a question or, or something and you just like, I don't know, feel free to call us anytime. We'll always be able to help for, you know, obviously for free, uh, you know, with pretty much anything you want. And, and the greatest thing here is we have such amazing people that we're going to know someone in the organization. I always say no one person knows all there is to know about security and compliance. And, and that is still true, but we definitely have enough folks that uh, will be able to get you the, the answers that you're looking for. So again, thanks again, everyone, for joining. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Jamie. Really appreciate uh, you guys coming in today and, uh, and walking through this, uh, this really hot topic. Really appreciate everyone joining as well. Thank you so much. Yep. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, guys.